In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord Jesus give you his peace. We celebrate today St. Ephraim, a deacon of the Church of Edessa. He goes by various titles. He's a doctor of the Church, made so by Pope Benedict the Fifteenth. He has titles such as Harp of the Holy Spirit, uh, Mary's Own Singer. And as such, he's a good patron for us as Franciscans of the Immaculate to kind of take under our wings, and we can almost see him as something of a maybe an amalgamation, if you could put St. Francis and St. Bonaventure together into one person. One, he was a deacon, as uh, St. Francis refused the priesthood out of humility, so before him, we're talking about in the 4th century now, uh, St. Ephraim also refused the priesthood. He refused, in fact, the bishopric, the episcopacy. Uh, St. Basil the Great uh, ordained him deacon, and later sent legates to him to uh, ordain him a bishop in which case he feigned madness. He uh, put on the countenance of a, a madman, and the people came back to um, St. Basil saying, he's out of his mind. And St. Basil was certainly on to him saying, the world is out of its mind and doesn't recognize this saint. Um, and so there's another instance where he also is like St. Francis that um, Father Rengers, in his book on the 33 Doctors of the Church, says that he was dissolved in tears. He was known to weep constantly. And the take that Father uh, Rengers puts on that is basically seeing such with such acuteness of vision the goodness of God and the sinfulness of man uh, kept him in a constant state of mourning or constant state of weeping over fallen humanity. And a lot like St. Francis in that case as well. Uh, like St. Bonaventure for his learning. He wrote and wrote and wrote. And it's thought that he commented on every book of sacred scripture. We don't have all of them. Uh, but uh, a very, very learned man and um, certainly a great light. He also has uh, many, many teachings that come down to us just very, very clearly today on the primacy of Peter, very strong, on um, insights into our Lord's passion and suffering, and also many profound thoughts on Our Lady, including things like the Immaculate Conception. He calls, um, he wrote, on you, Jesus, and your mother, uh, only you, Jesus, and your mother are more beautiful than everything. For on you, O Lord, there is no mark, neither is there any stain in your mother. So this is fourth century, a patristic text uh, regarding Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. Um, because he was so steeped in God's word, that's basically all he read and thought that was the only thing worth commenting on, it would kind of come out of his interior in different ways. Uh, father Rengers also notes that he's, in one sense, the father, uh, a father of our liturgical music because coming out of Syria, uh, the music that moved St. Augustine, the music that even St. Gregory uh, adopted kind of came through him, and certainly the Eastern churches as well, which in one sense he's almost an icon of Christian unity. We can pray for his intercession that we be reunited with uh, uh, the uh, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, but nevertheless, our liturgical music coming through him, he was a poet and um, many, many beautiful things. More thoughts on Our Lady as well. Uh, regarding her perpetual virginity. Um, he had the insight of that our Lord, having risen from the sealed tomb, is kind of an external manifestation of the mystery of Our Lady's perpetual virginity. He writes, The womb and Sheol, the realm of the dead, shouted with joy and cried out about your resurrection. The womb that was seated, sealed conceived you. Sheol that was secured brought you forth. Against nature, the womb conceived and Sheol yielded. Sealed was the grave, which they entrusted with keeping the dead man. Virginal was the womb that no man knew. The virginal womb and the sealed grave, like trumpets for a deaf people, shouted in his ears. Here's the mystery. And it's coming forth, of course, as Christ enters into the world through the, the in part to virginal birth. And uh, also the resurrection of Christ from the dead from the sealed tomb. Um, there's also a very interesting theme in St. Ephraim's thought regarding Our Lady as the Church, which should be of particular interest to us, who, uh, as Franciscans, uh, we 
uh, call Our Lady the Virgin Maid Church. And St. Ephraim was on to that. And there's also a very uh, interesting, we'll get to it in one second here. He writes this, The Virgin Mary is a symbol of the church when she receives the first announcement of the gospel, the Annunciation. This is um, also Pope Benedict talks about this, that you know sometimes we say the church was born at Pentecost. And of course there's a truth there. Uh, but in also a more mysterious sense, the church is formed at the Annunciation of the Woman of the Blessed Virgin Mary because we are in Christ. We're in Christ as we are in the church. He further writes, St. Ephraim, and it is in the name of the church that Mary sees the risen Jesus. And the editor's note says this, that St. Ephraim, in his writings, repeatedly fails to distinguish between the mother of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. A very, very interesting thing. You say, why? Uh, is, does his text of John 20 not say the Magdalene? Or perhaps is he onto a deeper insight that Mary Magdalene uh, is in fact um, the, the uh, uh, icon of the church as is Mary in a more profound sense. I don't know if we still have his writings on the Gospel of St. John, but if he took a look at uh, John 19 and what's going on there, did he come to the insight of our Lady as the Virgin Maid Church, and consequently the Magdalene uh, kind of carrying that torch. But nevertheless, an interesting uh, uh, occurrence in his writings is not like the man was stupid. Of course, we know that he was not at all. He was brilliant. So, But what had happened, what, why this failure to distinguish between the Magdalene and the Blessed Virgin Mary in this account of seeing the risen Jesus? The question that remains unanswered. Blessed be God, who filled Mary and the church with joy. We call the church by the name of Mary, for she deserves a double name. Another interesting insight is that he says, we, does that mean he as an author is saying we, or we the people of his day? Call the church by the name of Mary. Profound insight into what the church actually is, as the body of Christ. Um, and for she deserves a double name. Isaiah points to this a little bit in the uh, chapter 60 through 66, that I will call you by a new name. And that first name that Jesus says in, uh, as the risen Christ is Mary. He says, he says it to Mary Magdalene. Yeah, however, there's a deeper mystery there as well in terms of the church that he's founded and founding uh, in historical circumstances has this name has this name. It seems to fulfill the text of Isaiah. Uh, but nevertheless, and further on, he identifies the church with Mary herself. Um, he writes, he walked upon the sea, Jesus. He appeared in the cloud. He liberated his church from the circumcision. He replaced Joshua, son of Nun, with the virgin John. And to him, he entrusted Mary, the church, as Moses consigned his flock to Joshua. So a real perhaps mystical insight into what's going on at the foot of the cross with not only all of us are in John as disciples of Christ and sons of both the Eternal Father and also of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but also in a different way, St. Ambrose kind of gets at this with, you know, may the spirit of Mary be in each one of us that Mary also, uh, the mystery of the church is, of course, in a deeper way unfolding in her. So may St. Ephraim guide us. And again, in a particular way, as Franciscans of the Immaculate, uh, we look to St. Ephraim in a special way because he encompasses a lot of the, the parts of the charism that we have inherited down through uh, another uh, humble patriarch, St. Francis. <laughs> Misery.